Hello and welcome to the NXT Review. I'm Michael Sidgwick in the absence of Adam Wilborn and I'm joined uh, by fellow Dadly Boy Michael Hamflick to discuss everything that happened on last night's show. But before we get into it, if you're a fan of this sort of thing, make sure to subscribe to What Culture Wrestling on iTunes, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from for daily wrestling podcasts. We preview and review NXT, Raw, SmackDown, AEW Dynamite, AEW Rampage coming up this week. We review pay-per-views in addition. Conduct wrestler interviews. We post roundtables and a roundup of the week, complete with a bloody good quiz, of course, on wrestle culture. Hamlet NXT sucks. <laughs> it's uh, it's dead. It's everything that was reported at the weekend. Um, just nobody has told Triple H. Bless yeah. him. He's not had the email yet. He's, but to be honest, they've probably changed his passwords, and he's not been able to log in and read them. Um, I this wasn't kind of as we talked about in the preview yesterday this wasn't going to be all of a sudden all change just because we know things are happening at the top we're going to see them play out in terms of the actual output um and maybe nxt is all the worse for it this couldn't feel more irrelevant it doesn't feel of the time the action wasn't particularly good this wasn't a great episode on its own terms but that feels so much worse in the context of what we now know about the changes happening yeah, I mean, Jesus Christ. Like, I don't know why I continue to torment myself by going on Squared Circle or lesser pro wrestling websites, but I see the very small discussion, but discussion nonetheless about these shows and the reviews, and I'm thinking, like, oh, you're watching it. Are you actually watching this, or are you simply 14 years old? You've been told by voices that you respect um about what you think good wrestling is and you pretend to like it in a bid to seem cool or with it or whatever is this an aspirational performative enjoyment of a show because if you look at some of the booking decisions on this goddamn show how lifeless the atmosphere is i just think it's almost impossible to like like legitimately i thought the show was actively bad at points and i understand yes The action, the in-ring work in the main event was extremely good, extremely good. But I'm looking at the people who like this show and I can only picture Homer Simpson eating three and a half star donuts after three and a half star (laughs) donuts. And I'm thinking, oh, you're not sick over the past six, seven years of your life of three and a half star donuts. Like, gee, is that what you want? It's not even donuts because there's a sugar rush with donuts. It's those like slices of American cheese that he just picks out the fridge in the middle of the night. He's <laughs> yeah. not even smiling. Like at least when he's strapped in the chair, he's got this big grin on his face with the donuts. He's not eating them for joy. He's just eating them out of habit. And what he feels like is a duty to just keep eating slice after slice of American cheese until he feels sick and nearly dead in the morning when his family come down, which ironically is often the experience of a British fan watching this in the middle of the night or first thing in the morning. The family comes down and says to greet you, are you all right? No, I've been watching two more hours of NXT. <laughs> Are you okay? No, Adam Cole and Kyle O'Reilly are going 70 minutes. Uh, <laughs> so, no, I've, I've got a bit of existential dread at the prospect of that match. But before that was unveiled, Jesus Christ, and we will get into that, uh, the show opened with Saray versus Dakota Kai, uh, Dakota Kai um, who deputised for Ember Moon, who was missing as a result of an undisclosed medical issue. She was not cleared to compete. And the story of the match was quite simple. Saray was technically better than Dakota Kai. She outwitted her during several really quite well-performed mat exchanges. There was one particularly beautiful-looking springboard arm drag that I cooed at um, in order to gain momentum. Um, to use uh, their vocabulary. Uh, Dakota Kai just started fi- fighting far more nastily um, and then got to a more competitive back and forth. And then in a moment that genuinely pissed me off, genuinely pissed me off, they no-sold the hottest move in NXT, the most deadly-looking move in NXT for reasons I can't fathom. Like, if you're going to beat Saray, the logic behind which is dubious to me, um, I don't think it's a disaster, but it's still dubious to me. Um, at least give that a near fall, like at the very least, or at least don't just pop back up on a fire up spot because that move looks like someone's neck has been snapped in two every single time. So I got annoyed really when I saw that. And I kind of got annoyed at the finish. Um, Dakota Kai, um, what's that finish called, Hamlet? What, Dakota Kai's running kick? Yes. 
I can't remember because I always think of the go to kick, but that's her go to sleep variant, isn't it? She's yeah. named it something comic yeah. She's, yeah, something. She, she beats her with a stomach comic key. And <laughs> it forced a ray for the time being. I don't think she's buried or anything like that, but she did suffer her first loss, which was a bit uh, questionable, but ultimately. If you don't watch main event, it's fine because the idea is that Dakota Kai is heading towards a takeover showdown with former ally um, Raquel Gonzalez. It's a decent, ambitious idea, I guess. Maybe they could have beaten somebody else. But regardless, I left this match in two minds. One, maybe Dakota Kai is going to beat Raquel Gonzalez. Maybe if they were going to go to this length to get her over. Um, or they've just ruined the person who might have the next match at Raquel Gonzalez. Um, there's a bit of post-match um, in the aftermath. Um, Dakota Kai runs away from Raquel Gonzalez, who cuts a promo promising to end her at TakeOver 36. Um, how was this for you? Oh, like as great as it was, disappointing pretty much for all the reasons you've outlined there. I really enjoyed the match. Um, I thought they had absolutely terrific chemistry together. And it bodes well for Sarai that she can, um, and again, this is perhaps undermining everything she's done before NXT. And I apologise for not knowing more of her work. But it felt immediately like she could hang with Dakota Kai. You know, when somebody gets that first major opportunity outside of the rotation of jobber squashes that most people get on NXT and then they level up and then sometimes it doesn't really work or there's the awkward feeling of oh this is not going as well as we would have hoped um that wasn't the case with Saray at all so I've got relatively high hopes for her in the short term at least before you know NXT is transformed um but the whole vibe of this was undone because like Triple H's life is just the shock master. It's fell flat on his fucking ass. Um, <laughs> Dakota Kai, Emma Moon has gotten injured. That's like bad luck. He's having loads of it lately. You feel as if Dakota Kai has been put in this spot to get a win because of the main event loss, which is something that yet again felt like it was just done to, to poke the bear a little bit more. Saray has to eat a defeat here probably sooner than she should have had one. That was the, the feeling, wasn't it? You couldn't, couldn't just... Immerse yourself in the cafe because there was this sensation, ah, oh, they've beaten her too soon. Like, this was supposed to be Ember Moon. This was supposed to be her first big win rather than her first fairly substantial setback. She's been nothing more than a stepping stone for the, the number one contender en route to her takeover title match. And I think that overwhelmed it. But I just, it, it, Triple H is attempting to serve a gazillion masters and he's failing at all of them now, which is funny, but it hurts the performers. The post-match was the necessary and nothing more. I can't be critical of it. Um, because you needed Raquel Gonzalez, I think, to show a bit of fire at the first opportunity. You can't have that attack take place. And then the first time they're in the building together again, Raquel Gonzalez not act. So it was, they knew that and they know how to do this basic stuff. But I wasn't jolted out of my chair, finally getting to see them interact, you know. Maybe that'll come on the night itself. Maybe the match will over deliver. But I think this, so far, this remains a, a bit of a disappointment. Yeah, like, uh, just, it's, it was a clean finish, it was an ambitious get someone over finish, just at the expense of someone that I was rooting for, and felt like should have been better protected, um, basically the show can't do anything right, um, look, we mentioned um, in the intro that Adam Wilborn is not here today, um, unlike two weeks ago, he's not actually on holiday, he's, he's left war culture, uh, <laughs> and it's kind of heartbreaking because like, he's really great at his job as you'll discover when I butcher these recaps and I don't do anywhere near as effective a job at his dramatic readings but unfortunately for us but very very fortunately for him um, he's got a job on NXT Creative because he booked this goddamn index stuff and the way stuff to the absolute letter on the preview seriously go and listen to the nxt preview that dropped on your feeds yesterday and if you listen to it before listen to it again he got every single detail right basically what happens is after the the saray dakota kai match we get a recap of the whole um, love her or leave her match that was promoted last week and then we get a backstage segment 
um, with Indy Hartwell getting ready for her big date with Dexter Loomis and Mammy and Daddy. Johnny Gargano and Candice LeRae are a little bit apprehensive about this development. They think that Dexter Loomis is a weird sicko who's got bad designs on their daughter. <laughs> Candice LeRae is trying to... But she daughter. <laughs> but... Uh, I mean, my God. So Candice LeRae, but Doulon Tondre, says that, uh, you know, have you got protection? Have you got a Johnny for when he whacks it up you? And uh, <laughs> Indy Hartwell flexes the muscles and says, I'm a former NXT Women's Tag Team Champion. I don't need any protection. Yes, Indy, but have you got a condom for his penis? <laughs> because he might, because he might not be responsible enough to have one. <laughs> You've got to give it a cat. You gotta gather for the cat. <laughs> uh, so basically, we get a little bit of uh, physical. Um, that's what I'm looking for here. Mime, I guess, humor when Dexter Loomis flowers into what a gentleman. Um, knocks on the door to pick her up. Gargano, daddy, <sighs> answers. They stare at each other a bit. They don't really like or trust one another. Um, Johnny Gargano invites him in, walks in silently. And uh, Johnny Gargano gives some instructions about the date. You've got a 10 p.m. curfew and no funny business. Watch what you're doing with your cack. Um, <laughs> he takes the flowers and they leave. But Johnny Gargano has got something up his sleeve. He has tracked the location and they can do some spying. We'll get to the specifics of the date and why Adam Wilborn got it completely nailed on momentarily but before that we get a little inset backstage promo with hit row and um, who are your new baby faces and they get over as baby faces by burning a mask um, of lucha libre in a trash can fire situation american wrestling fans broadly react to what they're given I wouldn't necessarily describe them as a morally conscientious bunch, but they do not like it when a luchador's mask gets ripped off. They've inferred enough from Lucha Libre culture to understand uh, the gravity of such a thing. Um, so to get your new hit role babyface act over, they threaten to burn a mask. Well, I mean, there's probably a lot of people in Florida wanting to burn masks, isn't there? So maybe there is a babyface act down there. Yes. Um, yeah, I I felt nothing for this. I gotta be honest. I didn't read that into it personally, but that's a, a fair assessment as well about anybody that might have respect for the cultures of Lucha Libre. I I just thought this was a little bit lame. Again, um, they they walk a tightrope with hit row, hit row, and a lot of the time they fall off it. That's that's this act ultimately. They're uh, they're a fundamentally good act. It's a good idea. It's often performed excellently as well. To give credit to the wrestlers themselves, you can feel that at least a couple of them might end up becoming breakout stars as a result of this act long term within WWE, certainly at least. Um, but the segments just still aren't hitting every week. They're not. I hate you've highlighted this before. It's awful when WWE take terms off you, isn't it? But they are struggling to build momentum in the true sense because you don't have week after week after week after week we always lean on steve austin but it's because he's always the perfect example for everything like austin never missed week after week on route to his first wwe title and then even after he won it like it never missed you had certain elements of monday night raw that you needed to depend on and that's what's going to get people coming back the following week because they become a pillar they become an anchor on that show and it just haven't cracked that with hit row yet the, the, i don't think there's anybody on nxt that's got that but hit row have often felt like the closest mm -hmm. where like oh regardless of what's going to happen you've got this can't wait to get to this. Will, Will Bourne's probably had it with Cameron Grimes in the past. And Hit Row should be that now. And this wasn't that. And I think that's the that's the next thing they need to do in order to try and get this act to where a lot of people desperately want it to be. That's the thing with Hit Row as well. There are a few acts on this show that people want to be at the level that NXT believe it to be at. And they want to like stand on its shoulders and they're just not quite managing it with Hit Row yet. No, I completely agree. Um, we cut then to the ring as Ilya Dragunov, uh, the number one contender to Volta's uh, UK, NXT UK title, emerges for a promo. He says he doesn't really take much stock in words. You know, you probably should because NXT UK might get on the map. Um, <laughs> promos. There's certainly plenty of journalists in there that want to interview you. <laughs> Got lanyards and everything. Because where he's from, words don't mean much, but pain 
means a lot to Ilya Dragunov and it has informed his struggle, his blind belief and his fighting spirit. So instead of putting strength into his mouth, he put it into his fists. So with those fists, he'll do the unthinkable and he will dethrone Volta at NXT TakeOver 36. He is interrupted by Pete Dunne. Pete Dunne, who in this universe kind of has to no-sell the fact that NXT UK is a non-entity, resolutely fails to convince in his claim that he put NXT UK on the map, and if it were not for him defending the title around Europe and rebuilding the very legacy of European professional wrestling, Ilya Dragunov would not be standing in the CWC today. Ilya Dragunov um, rebuffs this. He says... I'm not here because you got me here. I'm here because of my fists, the power of which was transferred from my mouth. And <laughs> he says he's going to do the impossible with or without Pete Dunne's help and beat Volta, something that Pete Dunne never did. This obviously leads to a main event match. Dragunov suggests it. Dunne says he must be as dumb as he looks because he promises Ilya that after tonight he won't even make it to take over and he's not exactly wrong uh, look the verbiage here was rubbish but I guess they did the right thing by in a very lame execution telling you the kind of professional wrestler that Dragunov is oh god I thought this was all crap like all absolutely rubbish yes the end result was a half decent main event, which we'll get to talking like in more in greater detail on the, the content of. Um, Dunn's point was rudderless. Dragonov's retort wasn't that great. Everything descends into people just in a pissy pants slap fight, but with a microphone. You know, there's the, the arguing. It's a race to the bottom with these dweebs, man. Um, Dragonov, we said yesterday, Dragonov needs to come out and and he did in the main event to an extent show exactly who he is to an audience that maybe doesn't know ahead of this takeover match and enhanced WWE's presentation of this match that so far basically just exists around the highlights of their match in the BT Sports studio. So what he does is he just comes out dressed like a millionaire app designer and talks bollocks for five minutes. Like the, <laughs> po the polar opposite of what was required for a virtual unknown in a place that already lacks atmosphere anyway. I thought it was just a wretched presentation of Dragunov. Made only better by Dunn. Made only better by Dunn coming out because at least then there was a focus to what Dragunov was doing. Like, I thought it was just careering off the rails. Total rub... Like, in their mind, brilliant monologue character development, but it plays out as nonsense until Dunn comes out, and at least then they've got something to talk about. Worst thing is, as well, and you never want this out of... I'm assuming Dunn was the heel. There's no heels and baby faces on this goddamn show, but let's take Dunn as the heel because Dragunov's got to be a baby face against Walter. So we'll do it by orders of that. Dunn as the heel, telling the truth about the UK title, which is that it did mean something when he had it and it's meant half as much since Walter has. So that's not really ideal as well. They're kind of just bending history to their whims. I thought this was a massive, massive failure, regardless of how decent the match was at the end of the night. No, I completely agree. I completely agree. Um, what was a little bit better, LA Knight is just so goddamn confident and piss funny on the microphone. We got a backstage interview and they basically went over the events of last week and the week before because this company absolutely adores exposition because you people are very, very thick in their heads. He's basically rechristened Cameron Grimes as simply Butler. And I thought that was <laughs> funny. And uh, it was basically this little bit of preamble to set up the squash match that LA Knight won at the expense of Andre Chase. Like we're talking about one minute, the guy, the opponent gets one move um la knight does his finish bft and he wins it like in what two minutes if that it was basically pretext to get to the post-match angle um in which ted dibiase comes to the ring um la knight is pissed off with this tells grimes to get the hell out of there and in what is a stunning oxymoron that completely gets just everything about life wrong ted dibiase plays the avuncular billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> There's a rule-proven exception, and it's Tony Khan. Um, but billionaires tend not to be avuncular. 
And it's all a bit weird. Like, Ted DiBiase's never cut a more earnest babyface promo in his life. And I'm thinking, even when he did that legend return in Mid-South, he was... I was just going to say, was it Mid-South Ted wasn't as big a babyface as this dickhead in the seat of the sea. Like, like, Bill Watts does one of the most iconic, like, intricate angles of all time to get DiBiase over. And uh, still nowhere near as palpably OTT a babyface as he is <laughs> He tells Cameron Grimes, who might as well be like eight years old, given the inspirational spiel that Ted DiBiase just leveled at him here. I believe in you. I believe in you. I believe in you. These people believe in you. And about 12 people go to the moon, to the moon, to the moon. And I'm not taking the piss out of Cameron Grimes. He is over, but usually like three people are chatting anything at any given time. So the fact that he's quadrupled that reaction really is quite impressive. <laughs> Um, Cameron Grimes is trying to not get Teddy Biossi in trouble um, so he's trying to play Peacekeeper again he's like he's, he's 8 years old like he's an 8 year old kid in this angle uh, basically Teddy Biossi believes Cameron Grimes can be champion he says well why not have another match then LA Knight if you're so confident he's like eh, he's already had two He's already had two opportunities to beat me. I've beaten him twice. But then Ellie and I gets an idea. He says, All right, okay. A take over 36. We'll have a third match. And it won't be third time the charm. I will beat you again. And when I do, you will no longer be my butler. Ted DiBiase will be the butler. Uh, Ted DiBiase says that I'm a gambling man and I've got a lot of money to gamble. And then he forgets his lines. And then he can hear Cameron Grimes say, you're on, you're on, you're on. And you are on. <laughs> um, are you on for this? Ah, uh, ish, I guess. Um, it's all right. It's it's just all right. The DiBiase stuff, again, really jarring. If you, well, know more than one thing about Ted DiBiase's character. Like, if you know that he was more than just that laugh, or I guess like his theme tune, which is the only thing that they seem to have kept from this original character. Who the hell is this old guy? Like and another thing as well. I don't expect Ted DiBiase, the human being, to have all the money in the world, but WWE literally do. Get him some gear or something, will you? Like a billion, a billionaire, the million dollar man shouldn't be coming out wearing Georgia Asda. Like he looks, he looks like, right? And he talks rubbish. He's not like a complete betrayal of the original million dollar man character, but it's for this angle. And I guess, when you get older, you can sacrifice yourself. Maybe he's, like, developed the human touch, going to all those boring raw parties and having to catch up with Michelle McCool from the old days. I don't know. But, like, he's maybe he's just developed a way of speaking to people that he didn't have in the 80s and 90s. But, I uh, um, just, he felt more out of place in this angle than ever before. There's been other points where it's kind of, probably at the very beginning with Cameron Grimes, where it felt like it made the most sense and then it's made gradually less as the angle's gone on. Um sweet i suppose if and when grimes gets it done um the, it's probably wise to eventually retire them like re-retire the million dollar belt as well to take it away from la night he's kind of holding it hostage and what it represents if it represents anything he's holding all that hostage they could potentially craft quite a nice scene at takeover and nxt needs some of that so i uh, it's it's fine like the pressure is on them actually to have a decent match because I think their chemistry has surprised people, myself included. So if anything, um, on this card, when you've got that potentially hideous main event and the very confusing dynamic of the NXT title match, like they could sort of steal this from underneath. Um, and they've got some expectations on them now because their matches haven't sucked. Yes, absolutely. I'll agree with that. Um, get a kind of repetitive format issue here i suppose because we get almost the exact same thing a pre-tape follows a squash this one the subject of which is Yuji dolan who says that she's coming after the women of the um, nxt women's division and she symbolizes this by cutting up some roses um a bit of an on the nose um symbolism she says that's not a nine to five job like it is for ember io shirai or anybody else she's going to run through the competition in nxt but not by herself. Um, this sets up a very brief squash match um, against Amari Miller. Um, Dolan is situated as a heel by the fact that she has a cowardly escape to the ropes, but then when she gets the advantage, she does a finish 
I think it was called <laughs> the abdominal stretch bomb. Um, look, it's something I've seen in Joshi better, but you know, it's unique. It's probably the first time she's done it on live TV. It might get over. It certainly made an impression. In fact, that's one of the few things I remember from the show. I think the execution could be sharpened, but this is just a gentle, soft launch of a new character with a hint towards an alliance with Mandy Rose, which gives her character purpose. What were your thoughts on all of this? Yeah, pretty much the same. Um, was it uh, JC Jane that was with her as well? And again, yes. if Mandy Rose is kind of acknowledging them too, is is that going to be a stable? Is that going to be who she was watching and who she was scouting or whatever? Um, not a lot to grab onto, particularly with this match, but uh, you could see what they're building. And I'll, I'll, I'll give them a pass for it. And as you say, the finish was... And it is often the case in these squashes. NXT aren't always fantastic at the squashes, but they're typically quite good at establishing the finishes. Um, that one impact move, and then in the opener against Dakota Kai, they throw it away. But like at least in the in the initial stages, something happens in a match that you kind of want to go and watch. They've even done it with like remember that time that Casey Catanzaro won that tag match with that crazy eight thousand rotation. Oh uh, yeah, like, sent, sent on thing she did. I still maintain the last rotation might have been a bit of a botch but like it looked great in the end um so uh, this probably bodes well for Gigi Dolan that they've given her this specific spot and a, a finish that people are going to talk about felt very performance centery from end to end um but that probably won't be a problem in the near future will it that kind of style so you know. it's absolutely um coming to do we get a little advertisement for the upcoming um Adam Cole and Kylo Rayleigh uh Kylo Rayleigh Kylo O'Reilly face off um, and then we go to the restaurant. You will remember, if you are one of the few people who listened to the NXT preview, that Adam mm-hmm. Wilson said, when we were discussing what might happen, what's next for Index, he said, I can see them going on a date. He doesn't know why, Wilborn. I don't know why, because he's written it and they got bloody greenlit. He said he doesn't know why, but I feel like it's going to be an Italian restaurant. And I think they're going to have a nice little date, a nice little time. And we are going to see Johnny Gargano and Candice LeRae hide behind the menus so that they can obscure the fact that they are hiding um, and spying on Index. This is precisely (laughs) what Um, Before we get to that reveal, um, Indy Hartwell talked about how much she loves chicken fingers. Um, She orders loads of starters, like a woman after my heart. I love starters. Mm. I go to a typical restaurant and I look at the starter menu and I just think, I can't have loads of them. (laughs) I have a main, and then because I'm a little fat bastard, I'll have a main as well, actually. (laughs) uh, I will make myself sick by having the pudding that I know damn well I'm only having because I'm greedy. Um, Indy spots the spying. She grabs the walkie-talkie, having heard, overheard it rather, and she says, leave them alone. And Candice LeRae says, the jig is up, abort the mission, abort the mission, abort the mission. And in effect, if this was on a three-camera sitcom in 2021, you'd think, what? Yeah. I've seen this in the 80s and 90s one million times. For you, does the fact that it's pro wrestling and you're not going to expect anything of the quality of, like, I think you should leave or The Office or whatever... Does that excuse it, or do you think this kind of stuff, like, just, if you're going to do wrestling, just do wrestling? Is it a nice attempt to not do the NXT intense, boring stuff that we've been burying for a while? Like, what are your thoughts on it? I tend to judge, in all wrestling, not just NXT, I tend to judge stuff like this uh, individually on its own merits. Often, bad material will be carried by good performers, or bad performers elevated by good material. That kind of thing. I'm not uh, some sort of purist that doesn't that needs it, we you say it's in the early days of dynamite. I would rather they have the invisible camera than work do backflips to explain the invisible camera. I can allow certain things. Um and a lot of this got over the line. Like can we cover the rest of this just while we're here? Like right. a lot a lot of this got over the line. We had Johnny Gargano doing a terrible waiter impression in a daft wig. And I thought he did a really good job of it. Yes. Like you absolutely have to lean into how absurd you sound and look and are in this skit. And I thought he did an absolutely tremendous job. And of all the people to get a cake in the face, because it's wrestling, the cake has to go in someone's face, they pick the right person. It's Dexter Loomis, this guy whose face never moves, who never sells anything, 
get a full cake in it and then you somehow get the romantic ending with Indy Hartwell and the, and the cake on his cheek and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I thought they just about got away with all of this. Um, whether that's down to personal biases who really like in seeing Johnny Gargano and Candice LeRae, especially in these roles. Um, it's also probably maximising what you're going to realistically get out of Dexter Lemus as well. Because I said this yesterday, this doesn't lead to matches you want to watch. Like, we're going to get the mix tag. There's maybe some comedy to be found in the mix tag. But long term, this is not going to be like, yeah, the Indy Hartwell stuff really got into a North American title level. I don't want that. I don't want any of that. Um, this is not like Zelina Vega pairing up with Andrade and everything sort of magically clicking. This is just a bit of fun for the now where we don't have to think about the future. Um, yeah, this worked for me. And just to put over Will Bourne again, I love how once a week there's always something in the preview. Like, what are they are going to do next with Cameron Grimes? What are they are going to do next with Johnny Gargano? Like, why is he asking us that question? We need to be throwing that one to him. Why is he coming to us for the bits when clearly he gets these time after time after time? Absolutely. Tremendous bit of prescience from um, Adam Wilborn. And if you're very cynical, you'd be prescient about what came next because William Regal <laughs> um, entered the ring um, surrounded by security in a podium to try and give the idea that the animosity between um, Adam Cole and Kyle O'Reilly was such that um, they expected some kind of physical breakdown. And he labels the upcoming rubber match at TakeOver 36, the undisputed finale. Calls them both to the ring. Come on, children. Come on, kids. <laughs> out you come. Out you come. Um, and Regal, like, I love this, right? Triple H is still fighting for this title. He's still fighting for the bloody heart and soul of uh, NXT. <laughs> and I just love this, right? After being explicitly thwacked upon the nose with a understandably large newspaper, um, <laughs> this man has told Triple H... Stop doing this version of NXT. Want the high stakes stuff? The believe the hype stuff? The criminally good, emotional roller coaster, can't believe what you're seeing stuff? You know, the good stuff. AMC Plus has it all. Can't wait for the beginning of the end? Watch all new episodes of The Walking Dead one week early. Want to be chilled to the core? Set sail with the North Water, a thrilling Arctic drama starring Jack O'Connell and Colin Farrell. Plus, uncover gripping true crime content ad free and on demand. Expect the epic with AMC Plus. Sign up today at amcplus.com. AMC Plus, only the good stuff. Before we go any further, though, this podcast is brought to you by paintyourlife.com. They turn your memories into a hand painted masterpiece you'll cherish for years, all from a simple photo and at an affordable price as well. If you want a truly meaningful gift, you've got to try paintyourlife.com. You choose from a team of world-class artists and work with them until every detail is perfect. It's a quick and easy process. You can get a hand-painted portrait in about three weeks and it makes the perfect birthday, anniversary or wedding gift. And how do I know all this? Because I got them to paint one of the best photos from my wedding and now it looks even better. It's hanging up in our living room. Every element is spot on and the quality is unbelievable. Why not try it for yourself with your favourite wrestling image? Trust me, you won't regret it whether it's someone winning a title or... Titus World Slide. And at paintyourlife.com, there is no risk. If you don't love the final painting, your money is refunded, guaranteed. Plus, right now, as a limited time offer, get 20% off your painting. That's right, 20% off and free shipping. To get this special offer, text the word CULTURE to 64000. That's CULTURE to 64000. Just text CULTURE to to 64,000. Paint your life, celebrate the moments that matter most. Terms apply, available at paintyourlife.com forward slash terms. Again, text culture to 64,000. Sucks, right? Sucks. It's not the alternative anymore. People are kind of laughing at it because of the melodrama and manufactured intensity. It's a bit of a non-entity. Look, we're going back to big lads. We're going back to big lads. You are to sign Big lads. In fact, you know what? We'll get Johnny. Johnny can do that. He's got he's well um, versed <laughs> in that. Um, and you're just going to book them in matches, get them drilled, left foot forward. You know how this works. <laughs> and Triple H, in just genuinely impressive petulance. I'm not an idiot. I know this has been the plan from day one. And the fact that the plan 
has been in place since day one. Tells you all you need to know about how bereft of ideas this version of NXT is. Triple H has doubled down on what his vision for NXT is and just decided to be the most NXT thing of all time. It will be a two out of three falls match. Each child is allowed to pick a stipulation <laughs> for the fall. And if required, and God damn it, it will be, it needs to go 50 minutes, William Regal will pick this third stip. Kyle O'Reilly steps up. He says the only reason why he's not ripping Adam Cole's head off is because he likes his dad. His dad, of course, is uh, Mr. Mr. Regal. Is his teacher or his dad? Uh, he said he had lots of ideas for matches, um, but the loss of great American bash is really like gnawing at him. So he just wants a straight up wrestling match to prove that he's the better wrestler. Um, <laughs> and uh, Adam Cole says that Kyle O'Reilly is delusional. He says, I'll pick you fair and square once, so I'm more than happy to do it again. But um, he suspects that Kyle O'Reilly is also thinking to something that isn't just a loss, but the win at Stand and Deliver, which didn't really count. It wasn't sanctioned. Um, so he wants it to be a street fight. The basic story here is that they want to beat each other at their own game. And it will, of course, lead to what William Regal reveals to be a sinister structure. <laughs> and he says that there will be a steel cage match in the event that the um, first two falls are tied 1-1. I don't know if they will sell a tape loads of weapons to the ring. I, uh, <laughs> I hope so, because it will be funny. And basically, in the end, um, the words start getting a little bit more heated. And Kyle O'Reilly, I've looked at my notes i've actually watched this show and his character is absolutely all over the map i don't know what he wants to do i don't know if he wants to get over as a baby face or as this intense guy or what but this all feels so goddamn overwritten and confusing um but he wants to be the most dangerous man that adam cole's ever faced adam cole laughs at this and says that you've been following me for 13 years riding on my coattails you will never be me much less the most dangerous man i've ever faced he's a footnote in his career doesn't have the killer instinct um he starts taking his jacket off and cole like i like cole during this bit in fact, that my problem with this entire segment, rather than the goddamn match I have to dread, is the fact that Adam Cole was just leagues beyond O'Reilly on the microphone. I thought O'Reilly um, suffered confidence-wise here. He wasn't particularly believable or smooth. Um, Adam Cole sort of lapped him on that mic, and he laughed at him at the idea that he was taking the jacket off. We get the dust up, we get the separation, and we get the match. Are you looking forward to it? No, of course I'm bloody not. How, how did we get here, man? So that TakeOver Toronto main event should exist as some sort of monument to the end of the good old days, if I'm being generous. It, it probably peaked at New York several months prior. Gargano Cole was probably the, you, you know, reflecting on it now. But if we're being generous, um, that Toronto match was an absolute disaster. You know, you were like, oh, cool. Like they've had two bangers. They've had this genuine classic uh, in New York. They've had, this is Colin Gargano, obviously. They've had this really serviceable rematch, like one that nearly lived up to the quality of the first one at TakeOver 25. One more match, and then they do that just dreadful fan wank, weapons taped to a steel cage, over long, drawn out, scarcely believable because everybody just stopped selling, you know. Um, look at your hands, melodrama nonsense. And it was like right on the cusp of. Dynamite's debut from if I've got my dates right as well. That was like the summer event, wasn't it? For it was Takeover yeah. Toronto, it was SummerSlam weekend, whatever it was. Dynamite was on the horizon, and NXT just couldn't contain itself. That match could not contain itself. It was this complete. It was just a big one giant long mistake, and they're going to make the same one two years later. Two years of them not learning the lessons, as you say, of Triple H showing himself to be completely bereft of ideas. He's cooked. As a booker, he is completely cooked because if this was his plan from the very C double OK, we know he's been cooked in his workplace already, but um if this was his plan from the very beginning of the O'Reilly Cole feud, what well, what made him think this was the best idea based on the prior two attempts to get this one right? The Champer and Gargano one final beat, the steel cage match. I, I cannot fathom how they arrived upon this as the idea, even if right the Loser leaves NXT match wasn't the original plan. Why would you not go with that now, knowing what you know about what people know? 
as relates to Adam Cole. Why would you not throw that in as the like have one match so you're not scaring people? This isn't a match. This is a threat. It is. This is, this is telling me, oh my god, am I going to have to see sit through fifty minutes of this? Like, why don't you just say loser leaves, and then not only are you not effectively guaranteeing a better part of an hour being donated to this like nonsense, you also get to play on your most hardcore audiences knowledge that adam cole might be out the door it adds far more drama than melodrama which is what we'll get when we, when that steel cage lowers and vic joseph has got no voice left to scream about it um i just i don't have that look we might be proved wrong at takeover and the first four might go five the second four might go five and the cage might go ten but what evidence have we got to, got to suggest that's going to happen yeah, it's funny you say that. Why don't they lean on fan knowledge of Adam Cole's situation and do a more believable stip? How at this point, how isolated are they? Are the management team and the booking and the creative teams at NXT have they heard enough of the criticism, enough of it that they don't like, and decided, you know what? Don't like this. It reflects badly on me. Fingers in their ears. Let's just do our stuff and not listen to them because people, whether they've like outright expressed it or not, or whether this is reflected in the engagement and viewership decline that NXT has um, underwent in the last two years, people, enough people, think that this sort of absurdly long, parodic, no sell near fall hand staring melodrama has become a cliched weapon with which to smack nxt right across the head and laugh at it the fact that they are doing this specific match two years after those initial rumblings like oh crisis has jumped the shark and it's getting a bit daft the fact that they're still doing it is terrifying and maybe uh, Johnny Ace is going to save the day for developmental. <laughs> and imagine seeing those words in order. I'll tell you what else as well. Um, <clears throat> this match suffers even more so from the fact that, and this is chickens coming home to roost, ultimately. Um, what is there in NXT's DNA anymore to make you believe that the gravitas of this will even be honoured? One final beat by its very name, and I guess its nature, was supposed to be the end. And Gargano and Champa were both in that wretched four-way that didn't get a finish later on in the year for the title. Or um, a 60-minute Iron Man that didn't get a finish. Yeah. Cole and O'Reilly have already had the match that theoretically should be the the water settle score, the brawl to end it all, all of those like lovely wrestler cliches when they had a non-sanctioned match. Nothing can keep these two apart from one another. So they're gonna have to they're gonna have to kill each other. And then what happens after that? a rematch you know like there there's nothing at this point instilled in the viewer to buy into this meaning what this sort of stuff might have once meant triple h himself um probably fondly remembers pinning steve austin clean in a cage at no way out 2001 in their own three stages of hell match because that definitively wrapped up their long running storyline which by the way steve austin should have won because he got hit by a car but triple h won that angle let's not forget that but like he re probably remembers that and what that represented like some finality that's long gone toothpaste out of the tube nxt have blown that they've lost that audience faith so not only does this stipulation make many of us just think oh christ another hour of this it also doesn't give us any of the faith that it's over the only thing that makes me think this might actually be over for good rubber stamped is the prospect of Adam Cole leaving not that Kyle O'Reilly is going to beat him in a 50 minute match I just don't get why people like this and again I don't want to cast aspersions on do the they like this do, do you like it I've had people in my replies got buried have you seen the graphic for it no Adam the graphic like he looks like he hates his life so I picked up on that and tweeted so <laughs> people going, I'm down for this I don't really talk about it. I'm down for this and it's like here's what I think's happened uh, back when I was coming of age as a pro wrestling fan um, I would pick up Power Slam magazine and I would read um, a man who I immensely respected in Finn Martin, like, tell me that certain matches were good and bad. I'm thinking, what? It's all great. It's wrestling. <laughs> and then he a bit of sort of secondhand knowledge where you know what you think you're meant to know, but you don't really know it. And I was going, yeah, the Cruiserweights are great. The Cruiserweights are great. My cartoon network's finished. I'm going to flick between uh, TNT and uh, Sky Sports 1. 
yeah, yeah, slash Aru guy can really go. <laughs> this is what, you know, maybe yeah. this is what these people are doing. I don't know. I can't fathom why it's popular. We get back to back. Uh, yeah, but I was going to say on TN, sorry, like on those Friday nights, at least when you sat through like two boring hours, you got like a free view at the end of it. There's going to be none of that when TakeOver's finished. <laughs> sickle uh, <laughs> we get back to back backstage tag team stuff um chapter and thatcher talk about how um rich holland is just basically a heater for dun and Larkin and they don't really need one because they're proper tough men and i know what i actually believe it because i love them and um, they start dancing around the idea that um rich holland um is trying to make a name at their expense so why the hell not make me famous except good um <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Thatcher says, please, sir, if you will, which sets up a match um, with Ridge Holland. I don't know if that's next week or just whenever. Um, but next week's show actually looks good, unlike this one, which sucked. Um, on the subject of which, um, MSK, like, sort of hacked with the presumed help of Mustafa Ali, um, a vignette <laughs> from Imperium, and they mock them by doing the voices and the stilted posing, and then they collapse into what I really, truly felt was organic laughter, um, <laughs> claiming that I ah, couldn't keep this facade, uh, we're too cool for that, and it's too funny and they're too lame. And uh, they claim that they are the IV drip injecting life into the division, which is true, but you don't really say it. Because <laughs> uh, it just reminds you of how utterly dull and drab Imperium are when Walter isn't flanked alongside them. And this serves to build um, to next week's match. Hmm. What did you think of these segments? It's another case of, oh, bless Triple H. Old, I'd ruffle his hair if there was any left to ruffle. Because look at him still trying to build a tag division. Like, I thought both, back to back, I thought both these segments were decent. I wanted two matches. You know, I want the Champer, I want Champer and Thatcher versus anybody. They're an awesome act. But Champer and Thatcher in this sort of longer feud with Lorcan and, I was going to say Lorcan and Birch, but I guess Lorcan and Dunn, the kings of NXT as a group versus these two. Um, and yeah, MSK shouldn't say what they said about Imperium. Um, but as long as they win, it's all good because like, Imperium are deathly dull and need but Imperium need taken out the way so we don't need to worry that they're going to be the ones to stop MSK um, I like this division like there's a, a good rotation of very very solid to great acts that I completely believe as tag teams they're all very that, good. yeah that at one point or another feel worthy of tag title shots when they kind of like move the pieces around on the board I, for a this year, I would say, like, the NXT Tag Division has quietly been this brand's biggest success story this year. And, like, two segments back-to-back highlighted that for matches that I was keen to watch. Um, and it's something else that Vince McMahon hates. It's just something else that he's just going to buy off the second he gets his full hand on the wheel. I totally agree with that. It's been the most unheralded thing across all of pro wrestling media and discourse of how strong NXT's tag team division has been. Um, I probably should tweet about this to be more balanced, but I only get like 15 likes, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, up next, um, in what really isn't an unheralded success, which is what they're trying to strive for, which I guess indicts it, and we see the um, another fixture in the NXT breakout tournament between Odyssey Jones and Trey Baxter. It's pretty much a straight-up murder. Um, Baxter gets one hope spot, we get some nice interplay between just how gargantuan Odyssey Jones is. Um, Trey Baxter tries to wrestle him, but in fact, he can't even move him. There was some nice creativity um, early on. And I think Odyssey Jones has done a great job of kind of transcending these awful vibes exuded by this oppressive CWC. And he actually cuts an entertaining figure. He's a giant of a bloke, like he's animated. Um, I think me and Murray were on the Odyssey Jones train. Um, are you? Yeah. Um, it was clear from his debut that NXT seemed to be as well. He's felt like um, one of, I would say, only two real favourites to win this tournament. Um, and I like this because I didn't think... So in the quarters, Trey Baxter felt like a much bigger star than the quarterfinals of the breakout tournament. And then in the semifinals, he's kind of felt like the designated jobber for Odyssey Jones. Um, but he had a couple of moments to shine. That boot in the face that they wisely replayed was great. And it gave you one small memory of Trey Baxter as he falls aside. Well, I mean, you know, based on what happens to most people that get beat on NXT, potentially it loses his job at the weekend. I don't know. Um, find me a sadder wrestling promo. I'll wait. 
than Odyssey Jones after the match. What up, NXT Universe? Jesus Christ, mate, read the room. Um, and read being the operative word, because it's a fucking library. Um, just a desperate state of affairs still. The very concept of this breakout tournament in light of what is happening on this brand and what's happening with the constant release cycles and things like that. Oof. But uh, he was trying, bless him. And the in-ring speaks for itself when the promo probably shouldn't. <laughs> Are you ready to laugh? <laughs> <laughs> Poor dog. <laughs> Anyway, we get a little 10 second thing with Chan Shaw where disobedience will not be tolerated. I can't remember when any disobedience happened, if I'm being perfectly honest. Um, and the 10,000 year old dragon lady who was someone pointed out on Twitter is like at least several thousand years old, uh, several thousand years too old for this uh, repurposed brand. Uh, <laughs> and then we get um, a little rundown of next week's card. And then Mandy Rose um, links the Gigi Dolan win um, to her um, secretive talks um, a few weeks back. And then we do, in fact, get Tian Sha in action in the form of Boa versus Drake Maverick. Um, it's yet another squash on a show quite um, brimming with them. It's not particularly memorable. And weirdly, given that Drake Maverick, like, you can't help but, like, get your measuring tape out look at the Italian thing well you're not so <laughs> right, it's just one of those things but he gets protected in defeat oddly considering this is a squash um when the dragon lady blows mist in his face he sells it he gets caught with a kick to the back of the neck and that is your lot it's not enough and it's never been enough has it magic mist um that throw at takeover in your house they they bloody. <laughs> they made a rod for their own back, unfortunately. Um, and what we've kind of prophesized with this gimmick has come to pass, which is there is only so much that you can deliver when you set up even more. And it's just, I I used to think this when the fiend debuted, and it's like, well, you're not going to check his knee pads before the bell rings, are you? And it's like, oh, they did. He's as ordinary as it gets. <laughs> like, she's a thousand years old. She's got magic powers, but she's waiting until the referee's back's turned. Cool. Like, just, what a load of rubbish. What a load of patronising nonsense. Um, WWE, over the last year, profoundly, has proven that it cannot exist in this space. Um, I'll have debates all day about how you incorporate this sort of stuff into pro wrestling shows because it's all about context lucha underground made it work as a central theme really impact somehow gotten away with it quite smartly um well, Matt hardy was, if you like yeah Matt hardy was a pioneer in one respect uh but you, you cannot just drop it into the three minute television squash like they are trying to do here it never works it never feels powerful or potent um Bo's dead but like He's winning, so it's not ideal, is it? It's just the present day, like the whole thing doesn't work. It's all really disconnected from like the reality with which it exists. Totally all wrong. They've tried for forever to do something with this. The crowd aren't biting at all. It's wildly anachronistic. Uh, they should just cut bait. Like, I was, uh, at this point, they should just cut bait. Um, I would say it's a bad look for NXT, but nobody is looking. Um, <laughs> already um, covered the date night stuff. I did like how they linked the I've got room for dessert. I'm eat off your thighs. I, I can't do Australian <laughs> accents. <laughs> oh, it's cockney. <laughs> I thought you were like pulling a line from some like East Enders themed grot or something there. <laughs> I can't on your thighs. Um, <laughs> my key takeaway from this segment is that Indy Hartwell absolutely in real life does not want to kiss Dexter Loomis, which completely, it's not like Jim and Pam chemistry, is it? Like, <laughs> exactly. It absolutely isn't. Um, up next, following that, we get the uh, target takeover or prime target or whatever the hell they call it. Um, it's basically a vignette between Samoa Joe and Karrion Cross. And as much as I bury um, NXT for just right, leave it to the video lads. The bookers are taking the, the year off. This is actually good, and they've actually I don't think it's particularly great, but they have spent weeks 
building all of this in weeks beforehand with the old chaos stuff. Um, Samoa Joe in particular has a very good line. Like, he's great at cutting promos where he describes the difference between carrying cross as a house fire and a tornado. One's effective, but one's utterly destructive. I really like that line. Um, and, you know, it's really, really, really well done. Well done enough to make me hyped for this match. No, because carrying cross is in it. But how did it work for you? Yeah. Um, was it? It must be Jim Cornette. It must be. Um, who, when he was talking about how he had this year long money program, money in relative terms, between Basham and Damager. And then he's like, oh, mother, they're a tag team on WWE television. What the frig am I going to do now? How am I going to sell this match? And he had to rethink it. Um, NXT probably should have taken that approach because this was super effective in a world where Karrion Cross's Monday Night Raw run has never happened. Like, I thought this was the most effective point of this feud so far. Um, the video package, people earning the money, as always. Um, but but it does exist in the world where Karrion Cross has gone to Monday Night Raw and he's got a 50-50 record. And he's neither house fire nor tornado, is he? And with the best will and intentions in the world. Ah, t- do you know what this made me worry, if I'm honest, is that they're going to keep the title on Cross, um, which is hugely concerning because it's been, what, four weeks of trying to pretend that Monday Night Raw isn't happening and that's a failed endeavor that is a failed endeavor the guy is a in he's not a laughing stock at this point but he's a busted flush as the dominant and undefeated nxt champion it, it does not work the two things <laughs> just like WWE, they can't coexist um they absolutely have to put the belt on samoa joe and i'm becoming increasingly worried off the tone of this promo that they're not going to and how on earth do you proceed forward with Karen Cross as a champion when he's going to live the life of a moribund rank and file on Monday nights. I do not know. It's odd. It's odd. It's all very odd. Um, look, I know the developments that are happening in parallel on Monday Night Raw aren't ideal, but I'd be lying if I thought it was a big outrage. I'm not a Karen Cross guy. Like, if I'm going to do anything about this uh, segment in isolation, I'll just put over the video production team because <laughs> it's shout out because they're very, very good. Um, main event time next. And my God. Utter incompetence. I'm going to tell you why it's utter incompetence. After briefly running down the match itself, they try to tie it together the promo and the in-ring performance, which I guess was a clever idea. What you got here was Dragunov eating pain, using pain, fire it up, and there are a few better at looking like they are inflicting very real, like nasty pain than Pete Dunne. He leathers him with those strikes. He's kicking him to bits, all in safe places. The work's really nice. It's really effective. Um, A lot of the holes look nasty as well, but what stuck with me was the way Dragunov was just eating and eating and eating those strikes and then firing back. You get a glimpse of the character. You get a glimpse of the threat he faces from Walter, which is what this match sought to advertise. But like people just get it so wrong. And I hate them. Like, I just absolutely despise them. A lot of takes I saw, like, oh yeah, really strong match. What do you expect from these two? Bit of a shame about the finish, but no, no, no. It's a shame about the match because the finish just completely overwhelmed anything good that happened in it. People, I want to be able to articulate this perfectly one day. People will get confronted with the situation, right? This situation is entirely fictional, and with it being fiction, the possibilities are endless and limited only by your imagination, okay? So people are confronted with this situation as if it was a choice between one or two things. Something they've made up in their head that is worse, or the thing they got, which is, oh, it's much better than the thing I thought was worse. Why don't you think of something better instead? (laughs) <laughs> it's not real. It's not real. You can get what you want out of it. Oh, yeah, it's better than this bad thing that I've made up. All right, okay, well, why don't you just make up a good thing and criticise them for not doing that? The good thing in this instance is your number one contender to the NXT UK title is introduced to a new audience with the idea being that they had an absolute classic last year and they're going to replicate the magic of that classic and you ought to get hyped for the sequel to the classic by having this guy win. The guy loses against Pete Dunne with a musical distraction finish, which isn't really very sacred stuff from Volta, if I'm being perfectly honest. <laughs> and uh, the guy... <laughs> oh, okay, hit my music. <laughs> 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 you 
tracksuit with his finger on the button. Some dickhead on a lesser website is going to say something like, oh, you know, at least it wasn't a roll up. He could have. You're not cheering for your countrymen because they got the bronze when you really wanted them to get the gold. It's not real. He could have just simply won. He, in fact, did not win. Whether this was a little like play to Pete Dunn to like keep him on board, or whether he's too short. I don't know. <laughs> Full Lex Luger on this bollocks because I've got absolutely no idea anymore how to interpret the events. Regardless, all I know is that you do not, under any circumstances, job out your number one contender if, in fact, they're still going to have the match. Idiots who are going to say something about Hangman Page. I think the booking was rubbish. I could not have been any more down on the prospect of literally one of my favourite matches from last year. I thought Volta Dragunov was an exceptional bit of business. A classic. A match that grasped right okay. It kind of sucks when there's no fans. How do we make it less bittersweet? Right okay. We leather each other and smack each other so stiffly in mostly safe spaces that the fact that there are no fans means it's a feature, not a bug, because you can hear how harrowing it is. I would love the second match. I watch one episode of NXT, and I'm now not wanting to see it because I could not have been told any more loudly or explicitly that Dragunov doesn't stand a chance. What a load of total bollocks this entire segment was. And you say that, and you're right, and Dragonov might win, you know? Like, they might just put him over anyway. But to end this big... even if he does, it won't... It'll, it'll it's been the... undermined on yeah. this, you know? Um, if this was a plea from WWE, a sort of, come on, Pete, stick with us, we'll put you over here, we'll let people know that that UK title is always yours, just you need to get a chance to win it back. I think it was a grand misfire, because I spent 15 minutes here wishing that he would jump to AEW when that contract runs out. I love Pete Dunne. I love. It. I actually think Pete Dunne is underrated. I think I've said this before. I think he is underrated because people see his moves in isolation um, too often without seeing how he folds them into the body of his matches and how he approaches different opponents differently with the same offense, um, <clears throat> but very much in a way that puts over the strengths of his opponent before he either beats them, as he did here, or he falls just a little bit short because they're they're the better man on the night. He's just, I think he's just a super hyper believable pro wrestler. Most of this stuff is safe as houses, but I believe it to be just breaking wrestlers bone by bone by bone. Love him. Um, and I'll say this for Pete Dunne as well. Look, I mean, I, I want to talk about Pete Dunne. I don't want to talk about Ilya Dragunov. How much yeah. of a failure was this? Um, Pete Dunne probably doesn't, I know he gets a lot of deserved grief for some of the Brit Rez isn't dead for this isn't the way, all that kind of stuff. He was very pious in terms of believing WWE's spiel when they first set up the UK scene or whatever. He's also made quite a lot of like smart business choices in his own life, professionally and personally. You know, he's uh, he's played this, no pun intended, but he's played this game pretty well in terms of how he's maintained a certain aura through the undulating uh, lifespan of the NXT UK brand of the what that represents all that kind of thing and I think he's kind of avoid, I mean Christ compare him and Tyler Bate or him and Trent Seven or him or various other of those peaky blinders that lined up on the stage with Triple H in 2016 and he's escaped it all he knows how to work a WWE style if it's what he wants but I think he knows how to keep like fans that aren't as invested anymore on the hook in his matches I, I hope he makes an awesome professional choice if an offer comes his way because he's so young and he could have five years in AEW, just changing things up a little bit, getting over to complete new audience and then go back and he'd still be younger than the guys that are supposedly in their prime age on the main roster or in NXT. I hope he makes the call because I loved getting to watch him here in a main event. I was buzzing for him to win. I was rooting for him by the end. I'd sort of lost myself the like with an analytical eye thinking about how desperately bad this booking was and instead just enjoyed getting to watch Pete Dunne because I don't think we get enough of getting to see him excel in matches of this stature. I wanted Pete Dunne to have the Walter match by the end of this. Um, but you know, good luck dragging off. He held the belt up at the end of the show. So that's the main thing. 
Now, people might say, well, you know, he might have won if it, not for Walter. So, you know, it's not as if he got buried. Just book him to be someone who's got a chance of winning visually rather than you, someone who... You've done somebody else and have Elia Dragunov go over somebody different. It's not. <laughs> It is absolutely not hard. I don't know why I'm inventing people to argue with. I'm almost being a hypocrite, but at the same time, I just hate everyone. And uh, <laughs> except, of course, for the loyal listeners to this podcast, and we'd like to hear from you on your thoughts on this uh, week's show underneath the Twitter post <laughs> at what Culture WWE. Whilst you're there, you can follow Michael Hamflet at... Michael Hamflet. You can follow me at M. Sidrick. Once again, you can follow all the team at What Culture WWE for news, articles, lists, editorials, videos, everything else. Um, but until then, we will see you soon. Next up, a tune that's sure to get you in the mood for dependable auto and home coverage. I don't want insurance providers. I have insurance. I have insurance. Gives me every time. Visit AAA.com slash insurance and save up to 20%. Goodbye, insurance. Hello, 